Well, I don't know, did you notice a common theme uh, running through our three readings from Job 38, Psalm 107 and Mark 4? Did you notice that there were uh, there was at least one aspect running through all three? Um, what was it? What did you notice in all three readings? Well, I hope you noticed uh, at the very least um, that all featured the sea uh, and its threat, uh, perhaps. Um, and perhaps not only its threat, but the Lord's, God's creating and limiting power over the sea and its threat to human life. Certainly in ancient times, the sea was seen as a tremendous threat. I mean, put yourself back in time, you know, before there were the great ships that we see in our day, before you could fly across an ocean. Uh, when people did seek to ply their trade across the oceans, but in the kinds of boats and ships that might indeed face real trouble. The sea, if you've ever been on a stormy sea, you know how threatening it can be. Uh, or even just on a little lake or some such. The sea and water, great, great threat to humanity, even in our day. And even more so in the day in which these uh, readings, these passages were written. Um, the sea seen as an absolutely terrible threat to human life and existence. Uh, and so there's so clearly this idea of the threat of the sea, but also this sense in which God might have which in which God has made the world uh, and also has limited the power of the sea in some way or another. Um, I hope you notice that the similarities uh, were particularly strong between Psalm 107 and Mark 4. Um, very strong indeed. Uh, I wonder whether Mark hoped that we might think about the psalm, Psalm 107, uh, whenever we read his account of Christ in the boat. Uh, the themes are so similar. It feels to me as if Mark might have in some way styled his account of Christ in the boat uh, with that account of God and the sea in Psalm 107. For in Psalm 107, uh, we find sailors in ships and in Mark 4, the disciples in a boat. In both accounts, a storm arises. The sailors in Psalm 107 panic and the disciples in Mark 4, they panic too. The sailors come out, call out to the Lord. They call out to God, the God of Israel, while the disciples call out to Jesus. In the psalm, the Lord made the storm be still and hushed the waves. Then the sailors were glad because they had quiet and were brought to their desired haven. In the gospel, Jesus rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. The disciples were awestruck, not only because of the storm and its stilling, but also because of what the incident revealed to them about Jesus. So who calmed the sea in Psalm 107? God did, right? And who calmed the sea in Mark chapter 4? Jesus did. And if you want to go back further into Job 38, who was it that made the sea and controlled it? It was God. And in, in Mark 4, not so much about making the sea, but controlling it. God controls the sea in Job and in Psalm 107. Who controls the sea in Mark 4? Well, Jesus does. If God is the maker and calmer of seas, who then is Jesus who calmed the sea in Mark chapter 4? This is exactly the question the disciples ask. Who then is this? that even the wind 
and the sea obey him. For Mark and the disciples in the story, the calming of the storm was more than a nature miracle. It said something about the person of Jesus. Mark may hesitate to spell it out. He might not have the vocabulary to say it quite yet. For the gospel nowhere directly says Jesus is God. Doesn't do that. But here in this story, it gets quite close, perhaps as close as Mark will ever get. Who stills storms? God does. So who is this Jesus who stilled the storm on the Sea of Galilee? Does not the question raise something about this one's divine credentials? As Mark tells us specifically at the outset of his gospel, this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And if this story functions as a revelation of who Jesus is, it also speaks to those of Mark's readers whose distress and suffering, perhaps for the very cause of the gospel, was provoking questions within themselves. The storm was real and carried real threat and danger for the disciples in the boat. We take the story on the one hand at face value and we read it as a remembered incident in the life of Jesus and his disciples. Yet the story may also function metaphorically. It's no coincidence that pictorial representations of the church have depicted a boat at sea through all the centuries and generations. The storm of the Sea of Galilee can represent the storms of life that all of us face and that disciples may face in particular ways. Probably at the time that Mark's gospel was written, Christians were facing persecution of one sort or another. It was perhaps localised and sporadic, but it was there. And it raised questions for those early disciples. If Jesus is Lord, why does not the whole world acclaim him? And why are we, his followers, suffering because of our faith in him? Now, I like the little details of the story, don't you? What does it mean, for example, that as the storm rages, Jesus is found in the stern of the boat? I'm not a boat person, so I don't know. I think the stern's the back of the boat, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jesus is in the stern of the boat, asleep. I like the detail, asleep on a cushion. It's very nice. Think about it for a minute. What does it tell us that Jesus is asleep in the storm? Well, surely on the one hand, it tells us that Jesus is not alarmed. Everybody else is, uh, you know, frantically active, trying to solve the problem. And Jesus is asleep on a cushion. He's not alarmed. He's not worried by the storm. He's the Lord of the storm. Why should he be worried? Yet his behaviour might either soothe or scare us, depending on how we interpret it. There is always that matter of interpretation, isn't there? Whether we're thinking about God or just the behaviour of our friends or family, many things can be construed or misconstrued in a, in a hundred different ways. Here there are at least two, I think. How would you have felt if you were one of the disciples in a storm and Jesus was sleeping? Jesus is asleep. He's not worried. 
so I'm not going to worry either. That might have been a response. He's not worried. Why should I be worried? Or alternatively, where is Jesus when you need him? He's asleep because he doesn't care about us. And isn't this what the disciples say? Do you not care that we're perishing? How dare you go to sleep? I don't know if they said that or whether they dare to, but you get the message, don't you? We're frantically active about this. And you, the one who we might expect to calm a storm, is fast, you're fast asleep. Don't you care? Well, the disciples woke him up. And he rebuked, not the disciples, but the storm. Perhaps this detail suggests that in the storms of life, we too can wake Jesus, so to speak, by our prayers and by our turning to him in our distress. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay that we panic and are filled with anxiety. All this is okay if we turn to Christ in time of trouble and assail him by our prayers. I wonder, had we been in the boat, would we have just jumped to the wrong conclusions? Jesus doesn't care, and I certainly will not talk to him about it. I can see he's asleep, so I will skulk away and sulk. This seems to me to be our kind of attitude so often. Not represented quite there in the boat, but if you'd been there or I'd been there, would they say something like that about us? If Jesus is the Son of God, how come we see no demonstration of it in our lives right now? Disciples might have asked and might keep asking at certain times. Does he not care that we are perishing? These are serious and understandable questions for suffering Christians to ask. Some of us may be asking the same about a world in the grasp of a global pandemic. The gospel tells the reader and all those with questions that the storms of life will come and that they may not abate immediately. But Christ is in the boat. If indeed you're in the boat with him, Christ is in the boat. And with Christ in the boat, disciples need fear no harm. We could think about the communitarian aspect of this passage, where disciples in their distress together call on the Lord. But usually we think about it quite individualistically, as does David Adam, who wrote a, a beautiful reflective prayer based on today's gospel reading. Some of you will know it, I think. He saw that the storms of life are not always external, but may exist within us. The gospel story addresses not only the external storm, the winds and the waves, but also the internal storm. Do you not care that we are perishing? That represents an internal storm, does it not? Jesus addresses both. For eventually, he stills the storm and calms the hearts of the disciples. I don't know which came first. David Adam's prayer, based on this passage, says simply, Calm me, Lord, as you calmed the storm. Still me, Lord, keep me from harm. Let all the tumult within me cease. Enfold me, Lord, in your peace.
if you are experiencing anxiety, fear, difficulty or consternation. Can you pray David Adams' prayer? Margaret Rizzer set it to music. You can hear it on the internet. It's in our hymn book. Perhaps we'll sing it together at some stage. It can be a kind of chant that can be used, perhaps for the end of the day, to bring peace. Calm me, Lord, as you calmed the storm. Still me, Lord, keep me from harm. Let all the tumult within me cease. Enfold me, Lord, in your peace. Less obviously, Charlotte Elliot wrote a communion hymn, not always known as a communion hymn, but Charlotte Elliot wrote a communion hymn based at least in part on our gospel reading of today. The second verse reads, Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, Without, O Lamb of God, I come. Well, we're going to come in a moment or two to the communion table and thus to Jesus Christ. So we might sing for our communion hymn, Charlotte Elliot's hymn, Just As I Am, Without One Plea. Let's make these words our own and use them prayerfully as we gather round the Lord's table. We sing together, just as I am, without one plea. 